Hi, good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, my name is Matthew Kempton from King's College London. I'm stepping in for Ty Cannon, who unfortunately is uh, not available to be here for this for chairing this session. My co-chair is Stephen Wood. It's a great honour to introduce Professor Thomas Paus from the University of Toronto and Child Mind Institute, New York. Professor Paus's work focuses on the brain development of children and adolescents. And as part of his work, he's been analyzing multimodal data from over 4,000 adolescents. And this was in, within the new field of population neuroscience. So this leads me nicely to the title of his talk, Population Neuroscience, Observing to Change. Professor Paus. Well, good morning. Uh, let, let me start by congratulating Professor Manageli and her colleagues for putting together this wonderful meeting. I, I've been learning a lot over the past two days. Uh, it's, it's really stimulating all the work that you do uh, in the context of early intervention and psychosis, seeing all the transdisciplinary and transdiagnostic approaches. It's, it's really motivating. Uh, it's beginning to motivate some of our work, and I'll come to that uh, at the end of my talk. Uh, of course, uh, to this audience, I don't have to explain why we are here and why uh, we care about uh, brain development, because of course the majority of psychiatric disorders with their uh, really high burden uh, of disease are starting early on, 50% before the age of 14, 75% before the age of uh, 25. So we know that, we know that psychotic disorders are really disorders of brain development and we've been learning a lot about some of the factors that are driving this, uh, including for example childhood maltreatment uh, over the course of this meeting. What I'm interested in is really uh, to understand what shapes the adolescent brain. And of course there are two possible sources, it's our genes and our environment, and the interplay between the two of them. But as you all know, uh, the complexity is enormous. The complexity on the genetic side, the complexity on the environmental side, and of course, inside the brain. And uh, to address that complexity, we really need large numbers. And that brings me to population neuroscience. Uh, I will uh, give you a brief overview of how we are thinking about population neuroscience. And then I'll give you two examples from our work, one on white matter, the other one on gray matter, and uh, then I will uh, uh, finish with a few thoughts uh, about how that new knowledge may be uh, uh, hopefully inspiring certain type of interventions or how we can take it forward uh, in that direction. So let me start with an overview of population neuroscience. The way that, that I think about it is really a simple combination of three key disciplines. Epidemiology, that is helping us with the external exposures. Genetics, uh, helping us with, if you like, the internal exposures. And then we have the outcomes. For me, the outcomes are not social functioning, as we were uh, uh, hearing, or the clinical outcomes. The outcome for me is the brain. So that's the outcome uh, measure, so of course the distal uh, from the perspective of uh, the final outcome uh, being of course the functioning and the disease. Now a brief overview of each of them. Epidemiology, as many of you know, has a long tradition. It really started in mid 1800s in London when John Snow observed an association, an association between where you got your water from and whether you died from cholera or not. It was an association. It was also the first geomap uh, of uh, that kind of association between an exposure and an outcome. And it was pure correlation because, of course, there was no, uh, no agent known at that time that caused the disease. Vibriso cholerae was discovered only 20 years later. And I think epidemiology is extremely good in pointing us in the right direction. Sometimes maybe uh, we, we need to be careful about testing whether the direction is correct, but certainly it's discovering new possible relationships between exposures and outcomes. Now fast forward 150 years, uh, 
And we are in studies such as this one, again, based on health registries, this, come, uh, this time from Sweden, that showed a very strong association between very preterm birth and bipolar and other psychotic disorders. You can see the odds ratios go up to seven. I mean, huge, huge difference. But again, we don't know even uh, uh, about the directionality of that relationship. Could it be the genes of the mother that, that are uh, associated with prenatal birth and uh, then transmitted to uh, the children and associated with uh, psychotic disorders? Could it be, of course, that there is a common pathway leading, such as infection during pregnancy, leading to both prenatal birth and uh, psychotic disorders later? We don't know. So again, epidemiology is pointing us in a particular direction, and we then need to start digging deeper. Genetics, in, in general, is helping us a little bit to, uh, to try and put mechanistic explanations or, in fact, even inject causality in such relationships. And I'll talk briefly today. I'll show you an example from genomics, so using functional polymorphism to get some understanding of what's going on, in our case, uh, about the relationship between androgens and white matter. But I will spend also some time uh, telling you how we can use transcriptomics, so gene, gene expression to understand our phenotypes. But of course, there are many other ways we can use this field of molecular omics uh, to really uh, figure out or uh, get better understanding of underlying mechanisms of different associations or phenotypes that we are studying. And of course, as I said, outcomes, uh, in our case, uh, the outcomes would be structure and function of the human brain. I will be focusing, uh, and, and in my work, I do focus most of my effort on the structural side with multimodal imaging, studying different properties of the brain, rather than, uh, to some extent, with functional imaging, uh, looking at, of course, uh, variations in the activity of the brain. One of the reasons that I, I put more money into structural imaging is the real, uh, reliability. As you can imagine, as with any kind of behavior-based uh, approach, functional MRI does not have very high test retest reliability. Structural imaging of different sorts, and I'm not talking only about uh, T1-weighted images, also DTI, different quantitative methods, spectroscopy, etc. The test retest reliability of those approaches is much higher compared with functional imaging. And also, there is another advantage of structural imaging, and that is that we cover, with most sequences, we cover the whole brain in an even manner. With functional imaging, you see only what you stimulate. So you cannot, in you know, one hour scanning time, you cannot test all possible functional networks. So that's another uh, limitation of functional imaging. Now, uh, there are many developmental cohorts, many of them, some of them, I mean, the first one started really as an intramural progr uh, program at NIMH with Jay Geed and Judith Rappaport. And we have been involved in, over the years, in, in a large number of them. In yellow are the cohorts that, that I'll be uh, using uh, data uh, today. Uh, in particular, the Sargona Youth Study, which is uh, a study that we started in Canada, and I'll tell you more about it as we go. The asterisk indicates uh, birth cohorts. Of course, they are extremely valuable. We heard about ALSPAC, for example. We, we have been using ALSPAC data in our work. Uh, a big study uh, that, that, that we haven't heard about, I think, at least I would have missed it, and uh, Generation R, based in Rotterdam, 10,000 strong, with almost half of them being scanned for the first time at about the age of 10, and then now going into the first follow-up. Uh, so, in my work, I really focus on the adolescent brain. Adolescence is, of course, a very interesting period, in particular for those two reasons I indicated here. That's where sociology meets uh, biology, if you like. Uh, so, of course, sex hormones on one hand, peer social interactions on the other hand. And so it's, it's really a, a very interesting and dynamic period of life. But it also is a period when uh, many, of course, psychotic disorders emerge or, or change their trajectories, as we've been hearing uh, about at this meeting. And one thing that, that really motivated me to set up uh, the Canadian study 
is a, a well-known classical finding that I'm showing here by Hefner in, uh, in the 90s, where they showed that pretty much you know, the first symptoms, first hospitalization, et cetera, of schizophrenia begins about five years earlier in men compared with women. We heard about uh, some consistent findings with this at uh, one of the symposia yesterday or two days ago uh, on sex differences uh, in, in psychosis. So it seems that that's really holding up that original uh, beautiful study that, that they published here. So what is it? that's going on in the adolescent, in male adolescents, that might be speeding up the emergence of psychosis in young men compared with young women. And that's, uh, that was one of the motivations, and, and it's relevant. I think the first part of my, uh, of my talk is, is really, you can think of it, of the results in, in this context. I encourage you to do so. So we'll start with the white matter. More than 10 years ago, uh, we have set up the Sagone Youth Study. It's a study based uh, about, well, in Canada, in Quebec, uh, province, of, uh, uh, province of Canada, uh, about the Sagone region is about 500 kilometers north of Montreal. It's uh, a home of a genetic founder population of French Canadians, so it's genetically and culturally more homogeneous than any other uh, North American city that, of course, it are, uh, that are, of course, ethnically mixed. And that, that is uh, an advantage when you are uh, dealing with complex traits, such as, of course, the brain or psychiatric disorders. And we have recruited and phenotyped in detail, including, including imaging, over 1,000 adolescents and their parents. The, uh, this study is family-based, so we have about 500 families two children from each family, and both biological parents, uh, provided that they are alive. And uh, the protocol focuses both on the brain, but also on cardiovascular and, met and metabolic health. So we have a wealth of information that, uh, that has been collected over uh, about 15-hour protocol, of course, over several days. Plus, uh, of course, the genetic information, epigenetic information, and a lot of uh, uh, data on, uh, from, from plasma, for example, epidemics. Now, one of the first observations we made in this study is this, the fact that uh, volume of white matter increases between the age of 12 and 18 in boys very steeply, but not in girls. And that's not simply uh, because we missed an increase in white matter volume uh, in girls uh, that, that would have occurred earlier. No, it's, it's known also from other studies that white matter increases more steeply in boys compared with girls. So, of course, the obvious uh, uh, reason for that to look for and check is testosterone, and we had uh, morning samples of testosterone from plasma, and uh, instead of just simply correlating testosterone with white matter, because, of course, it correlates with age, so there would be a correlation. We used functional polymorphism in androgen receptor gene to test it in a little bit more causal way. So this polymorphism in uh, exon 1 of androgen receptor gene is the number of CAG triplets. The more triplets you have, less efficient androgen receptor uh, would be in, in, in your system. Now it's an X-linked, so we can do that only in males, not in females, because in, in females we don't know which of the X chromosomes is silenced. Now, of course, our prediction then is that that relationship that I showed you, or a relationship between testosterone level and white matter volume, would be much stronger in boys with the more efficient androgen receptor, that is, the ones who have lower number of CAG triplets. We just split it by median, and we'll be looking now at, uh, at uh, boys with low or high uh, number of AAG, uh, CAG triplets. And as you can see here, uh, the boys with the short version, the more efficient version of androgen receptor, we can explain much more variance in white matter volume by testosterone levels than, than it is the case for the less efficient androgen receptor. And that tells us that yes, the androgen system is indeed in a causal way in, uh, involved in driving uh, those increases in white matter volume during adolescence. But of course, the question is, uh, what's increasing? 
And, and typically, if you are reading the literature, the, the, the literature predating our findings, everyone would be thinking about myelin. We all know that myelination continues to the third decade, so that would be your instinctive answer. Oh yes, it's myelination, and perhaps it's progressing more uh, faster in boys compared with girls. Now, of course, we need to keep in mind that axons are, of course, also uh, have the part of cytoskeleton, and that's, of course, a, a lot of volume here, neurofilaments and microtubules, the myelin thickness is actually less, occupying less volume here. Now, we had uh, another MR sequence that can give us more specific information about myelination. It call, uh, it's called uh, magnetiz magnetization transfer ratio, MTR. And you would predict, if it was about myelination, that MTR would go up with testosterone levels. More, my more myelin, more MTR. And what we see here is exactly the opposite. Especially in the boys with the more efficient version of the androgen receptor, MTR values are actually going down. Now, you know, MTR is used very often to study demyelination in MS, multiple sclerosis. Uh, we are not, of course, saying that the boys are demyelinating. So what's going on here? Even though I always say the girls from the class would have maybe said, yes, they are demyelinating, but they are not. So think about uh, the white matter now, looking at this electron uh, microgram from the monkey corpus callosum. So the axons come in different sizes, they have different thickness of myelin sheath, and this axon, this part of the figure, is not different magnification. It's the same magnification as the other side. So you can have axons that are really huge. Now imagine for a second that, for whatever reason, in that male brain, as under the influence of androgens, we are shifting a little bit towards bigger axons. I'm not saying that all small axons are replaced by this, that would be a disaster for the male part of the audience, but, uh, but imagine what happens if you have more of those. Well, you have less space for myelin, because all that space is now filled up by the axon. And that's what we put forward as an explanation of our finding, that in fact there is a growth radial growth uh, of axon. The caliber is increasing in males during puberty, and therefore axons are taking up more space in that one voxel of uh, scanning volume than myelin. But of course we needed to test that, and for that we went to uh, an experimental model, young rats, uh, corpus callosum, sampled hundreds of axons and measured their diameter and their uh, thickness of the myelin sheath. And as we predicted, males have bigger axons, and now we measured it, so we know that that's the case, uh, compared with females. And what we could also do, which of course we cannot do in our population-based studies, we castrated the males uh, just uh, before, uh, after weaning. And as you can see, the castration eliminated essentially the sex difference in axon caliber, also in G ratio, which is the ratio between axon diameter and fiber diameter, which tells us about the uh, thickness of the myelin sheath. Now, many of you are psychiatrists and psychologists, and so you are by, by now really disappointed with me talking about anat anatomy all the time and why should we care. Of course you need to care, because of course the anatomy is, is the substrate of function, and in this case, the function is axonal transport. So we need to think about white matter not only in the context of conduction of electrical impulses, but also in the context of the transport of everything we need, for example, at the synapse that is made in the cell body and needs to get down the road to the synapse, and that's axonal transport that is carried out by motor proteins here, that are running on microtubules, and they are, that's a beautiful machinery. I'm showing you one of those proteins here, kinesin, that moves cargoes in anterograde direction from the cell body to the synapse. It walks on the microtubule. It's powered by ATP here. The legs are powered, uh, of course, in this way. And then you have the arms here that are holding those cargoes and there may be very many different types of cargoes, and then offloading them whenever they, wherever they are needed. 
at the node of Runvia, at the synapse, right? And I'll come back to uh, all the different cargos. So the question is, is there a link between the thickness of the axon and uh, the rate of axonal transport? And that was a beautiful study done uh, in the monkey with manganese imaging. If you inject manganese into the eye, in this case, of that, uh, this experimental model, and you wait for hours or few days, and then using MRI, you look where that manganese got, and manganese is internalized to vesicles, put uh, into those cargoes, and axonal transport carries it forward in anterograde direction. It gets much faster to the part of uh, LGN, lateral geniculate nucleus, that receives big axons, the magnocellular portion of it. So large axons, manganese gets there faster compared with the small parvocellular path that uh, has, of course, now low capacity for axonal transport. Now, what we decided to do to test our ideas about testosterone, we took that uh, axonal transport idea to a dish with sympathetic uh, neurons here, plated in a corner, waiting for a few days until they grow axons beautifully, and then adding different dose of synthetic testosterone that would not convert to estradiol. So that's called mebellarone. And then we were measuring the speed of the axon. We would add V germ agglutinin that goes into vesicles. It's taken up, and it moves both in retrograde and anterograde direction. Maybe we can put the light down a little bit so you can see images that I really am excited about, because here we know what we are seeing. With structural or functional imaging, we have no idea. We have signals, but we don't really know what neurobiology is. But here we see the vesicle with V-germ agglutinin that is moving, in this case, in retrograde direction. And we can measure the speed. We can measure how often it stops, et cetera. Right? So we know exactly what's going on here. And when we do that and look at the effect of testosterone after six hours, we see that anterograde transport is suppressed. There are no differences in ret retrograde. But in this case, anterograde is suppressed. We wait for 24 hours, no differences. We wait another 24 hours, and the transport is enhanced. So that's very important, because in the span of 48 hours, we go from much less to much more. And I'll come back to that idea in, uh, towards the end of my talk. We also see that, in fact, the, the time when the motor protein is holding onto the cargo and marching with it without a stop so-called maximum run length is also influenced by testosterone, even uh, after 24 hours if you give a higher dose, but uh, with the lower dose you just wait for 48 hours. So what's going on? What's going on is we have probably fast non-genomic effects, probably related to influx of calcium and dissociation of those cargos from the motor proteins, from those arms. And then we have the genomic effects, gene expression, most likely increase in the expression of kinesin proteins. So we, you have just simply more motor proteins, more trucks that can be taking up cargoes and driving it down the road to the synapse. Now, here is why I think we really need to pay attention to axonal transport. Without it, the cells will die. They will have no energy. We will not have all the uh, machinery that we need for synaptic neurotransmission. So it is really essential for normal functioning of the brain. And I'll come back to that uh, a bit later. So let me now move quickly into the gray matter part. Uh, as you know, uh, and I'll uh, touch on those three, uh, three uh, potential shapers of gray matter. You may know that cortical thickness as one of the measures of uh, cortical gray matter decreases with age uh, during adolescence. As you can see here, it decreases more in boys compared with girls. We explain about 28% per percent of variance uh, by age uh, in boys, 10% in girls. And we published a few papers that show that, to some extent, this is also uh, driven by testosterone, certainly in males. Now, the question I will ask today is, is that decrease in cortical thickness 
uniform across the cortex, and if it's not, then what might be behind those inter-regional inter differences in thinning of the cortex? We can use the same uh, uh, algorithm that, uh, that uh, gives us the number of average cortical thickness, free surfer, that divides up the brain to each hemisphere to more or less arbitrary 34 regions, as you can see here. So we can now look at the thinning, the correlation of thickness with age in each region. And when we do that and look only at the squares for males here, just to get an idea, you can see that as you go from the front of the brain to the back of the brain, the, uh, there are variations in uh, the strength of that negative correlation between thickness and age. With two exceptions here, uh, all those regions are showing thinning. So age-related uh, decrease in cortical thickness. And as we, you expect from the first slide, it's more pronounced, of course, in boys compared with, with girls. But the pattern is there in both sexes. So how can we now look for differences in those different regions that might be related to differences in the rate of thinning. And one way to do that is to go to transcriptomics, to gene expression, and ask, are there similar variations in the expression of relevant genes across those 34 regions that we might then relate to, of course, the rate of thinning? And to do that, we use data from the Allen Brain Atlas, that has surveyed all 20,000 genes, expression of all 20,000 genes at many thousands of locations in the human brain, but only in six left hemispheres. So now someone who works with hundreds or thousands of brains, I was very skeptical about using a data set uh, that has only six, uh, six individuals. So with my postdoc then, uh, Leon French, we looked at, uh, we decided that we'll be studying using only genes that have a very similar profile in all six hemispheres. And we quantified it by calculating median, uh, donor to median correlation coefficient. And somewhat arbitrarily, if that correlation is above 0.44, then we'll work with those genes. If it's below, we'll ignore them for, for the purpose of this kind of work. Luckily, two genes that we are interested in androgen receptor gene and glucocorticoid receptor gene, uh, they have very high values about 0 0.8 or, or so, so, so we know we can trust the variations in uh, their expression across the cortex. So now we will simply ask, are variations in thinning, variations across the 34 regions, uh, are variations in thinning following similar, have similar profile as variation in the expression of those two genes. And here I'm showing you this, uh, this correlation now. This is correlation across 34 regions. Each dot is a region. So we see that there is a, a correlation between thinning and MR expression of the androgen uh, receptor gene explaining about 25% of variance. In, in those variations across the cortex in boys, a little bit less than percent in girls. So that's androgen receptor. And in fact, the glucocorticoid receptor explains even more variance. You see in boys, 46%, in girls, 30%. So that, that tells you that there is something that, uh, that, that is driving, that, that those two systems, the androgen receptor-based system and glucocorticoid receptor-based system, that they contribute to uh, the extent to which uh, those systems would be driving thinning of the cortex across the entire cerebral cortex. So that's, that's a useful piece of information to have. And we are using it now also to, for example, test other ideas about uh, an example of one work that is ongoing in the work uh, in the lab on income inequality and uh, income inequality and its relationship to brain maturation. Now, uh, one more factor that, of course, uh, many of you uh, may be uh, interested in in the context of psychosis uh, and, and in our case, brain, uh, brain matter, brain development is, of course, cannabis. Cannabis in the context of the two-head hypothesis of schizophrenia that really tells us that something is going on uh, 
during, uh, during the early prenatal or perinatal period. And then there may be a second hit during adolescence, whether, whether it's cannabis, immigration, any other uh, type of stressors that when combined in certain individuals would increase the probability of developing psychosis. And of course, cannabis, as you all know, is, is of course a very, uh, very good target to explore in this, in this context. Uh, its use is uh, very common. Uh, certainly in developed countries, 30% of uh, kids would have experimented with cannabis by the age of 16. Uh, we know that it does increase probability of schizophrenia. I told you that schizophrenia begins in, uh, in young men earlier than in young, young women. And I also showed you that uh, the structure, at least, the brain structure is a little bit more, uh, more dynamic during adolescence uh, in the male brain compared with the female brain. So that's why uh, our prediction was that if we see anything, we should be seeing it in males uh, more likely than in females. And so in our model, uh, we use polygenic risk score for schizophrenia as a proxy, if you like, of the first hit, because of course many of those genes are likely to influence brain development. Then we have cannabis here, and we of course don't have psychosis here as an outcome. Our outcome measure is cortical thickness. And we did that uh, as a replication study starting in the Sargonet study, again in Canada. Then we scanned 500 Alspach participants, uh, all men and uh, uh, about 2,000 participants from the Imagen project, I think John had mentioned, uh, one, one study coming from this consortium. Now, what do we see? So, uh, first of all, these are the 108 loci. You know that psych uh, Psychiatric Genomics Consortium, when comparing 30,000 patients with 100,000 controls, identified with high fidelity those 108 locations that are marked by single nucleotide polymorphisms. You can, of course, sum those risk variants together and create a score. And when you calculate that score in our sample, that's the distribution. And for the simplicity here today, I will just simply split that score again by median, and we'll be looking at uh, boys with high score above median, so they are high risk, and uh, the ones below the median are low risk. But that, of course, doesn't mean that they are really at high risk of psychosis, right? I mean, that risk is tiny increased a little, bit, uh, a little bit more. So it's not the same as when you are talking about high risk or ultra high risk individuals. These are normal kids from high schools doing well, average IQ 104, uh, so it's relative, right? Within that population sample, they have high or low polygenic score. And this is what happens. If you have high polygenic risk score for schizophrenia, and you ever used cannabis, your cortex is thinner. That's the Sargonet study, the original sample. The same is seen, especially if you use cannabis more in Alspach and also in Imagen. In Imagen here, I'm not showing age-adjusted thickness, I'm showing the degree of thinning, because there we had already two time points, so I'm showing you that in fact there is a slightly accelerated thinning of the cortex if you are in the high-risk group and you experimented with cannabis. And we see none of this in the low-risk group, so there are no differences. So we have, of course, a fairly strong uh, gene by exposure interaction when it comes to cortical thickness. And we did not see anything like that in, in girls. There were some trends, but it's really uh, seen, this pattern is seen only in boys, and that's the data that I'm, I'm showing you. So, uh, now of course, the last question for cannabis is, is it really cannabis? Is it THC? Is it what you are inhaling uh, that is driving those differences? Because as you can see in all epidemiological studies, there are so many confounders that, that we cannot really control for. We can control for some statistically, but I don't find it very satisfying. So. We go back again to the idea that I, I explained to you with the androgen receptor and glucocorticoid receptor gene expression and ask, are the group differences between users and non-users, group differences in cortical thickness different depending on how much cannabinoid receptor one uh, 
uh, you have in the different brain regions. So we again use Allen Brain Atlas. We see the distribution of CNR1, the expression of CNR1. We see that some regions, for example, here the anterior cingulate cortex, have high values of CNR1 expression. Some regions, such as primary visual cortex, have very low expression of this, uh, of this uh, gene. Does the pattern of the group differences follow this pattern? And as you can see, it does, both in the high and low group. Uh, the more of the CNR1 you have, the bigger the decrease in cortical thickness or the thinning uh, in, in the exposed individuals. So that suggests to us that, yes, CNR1, the cannabinoid system, does have something to do with the observation of a relationship between cannabis use and cortical thickness. So again, the transcriptomics is helping us to interpret our data. So let me finish up with just a few thoughts, and, and that's really mostly speculative what I'm going to tell you, but hopefully it will help you understand how, at least in our hands, how we are thinking about using the new knowledge that we generate into and trying to translate it into a tangible uh, intervention, for example, so uh, influencing really the lives of, uh, of the kids. So as I told you, uh, I'm obviously excited about axonal transport as a very powerful biological mechanism that is critical for smooth functioning of the human brain. People who work on dementia have known it for many years. Neuro neurodegeneration, the dying back degeneration, invokes mechanisms of axonal transport. If you type in dementia or neurodegenerative disorders and axonal transport, you would get hundreds of papers. And I think that it's time that we can start thinking about axonal transport also in the context of developmental, neurodevelopmental disorders. Now I say that again because I think that the wide matter should be viewed also as a transport system, where the axonal transport, I told you about all uh, the influence of axonal transport on uh, the function, but as you can imagine, you actually need to use axonal transport to build the axon and to maintain the axon. You have to bring the uh, microtubules or the building blocks of microtubules, so there is a circle right, from axonal transport to building the axonal cytoskeleton, and that axonal cytoskeleton is then, of course, supporting axonal transport. So if you break, break it at one point, everything starts collapsing. But maybe we don't have to be thinking about it in such a dramatic way as, in fact, people working on neurodegenerative disorders are thinking about it. Maybe we should think about the axonal transport and axonal cytoskeleton in more dynamic way, in that, of course, if you have fluctuations in axonal transport, you may not be able to keep your neurotransmission within a normal, what we call here, or what the Gina Turigiano calls homeostatic uh, range. So I'm illustrating here that those asterisks are the time points when, for whatever reason, uh, we got out of that homeostatic range whether for whatever function, in this case, let's say firing rate. And of course, that's not good for stability. You need to have a stable system. If you don't have a stable system, then you go crazy. So, uh, so I think that we need to think about it in, in this particular way. So then, of course, we need to ask, what are the potential sources uh, of those perturbations that may induce those fluctuations in axonal transport? I already told you a lot about androgen. I put two other ones that are relevant here in the context of adolescence and, of course, mental health, stress and sleep. We know that chronic stress, uh, postnatal stress in rats, is going to, of course, increase corticost uh, corticosterone, but also increase phosphorylation of microtubule-associated protein, tau, and it would also affect transport of mitochondria. So clearly, stress go is going to affect uh, axonal transport. And uh, in the context of sleep and any other immune activation, Again, for example, in this case, pro-inflammatory cytokines such as TNF-alpha 
are going to influence axonal transport. You can see that adding to a dish a little bit of DNF alpha, uh, after 20 minutes, you have a decrease in the movement of mitochondria. Again, the mechanisms of axonal transport are affected by uh, molecules such as DNF alpha. So then, let me put it in the context of uh, House and Murray's paper here, where they talk about, of course, acute psychosocial stress leading to aberrant processing of stimuli. Their, of course, explanation, favorite uh, hypothesis, is the dopamine one. Now, you can even plug in axonal transport right there, because, of course, dopamine transported gene and dopamine transported protein needs to be synthesized in the cell body and transported down. So even there. But I would just simply now in, uh, generalize their scheme and uh, their, their call for or the points of intervention here and move it to, uh, the, uh, to the realm of axonal transport, where we have, of course, psychosocial stress, sleep deprivation, androgens, inflammation. Uh, we have all those different potential influences on axonal transport and therefore on fluctuations in the transport with the resulting fluctuations in homeostatic uh, uh, plasticity, and therefore in potentially processing of stimuli, in setting uh, cognitive biases, and eventually leading to psychopathology. So, so we can, of course, now that we know about one potential biological mechanism here, grounded in axonal transport, we can start thinking about how we can influence or prevent such fluctuations by of course, interfering at different levels where we can with psychosocial interventions. But, and I didn't tell you that, lithium, a mood stabilizer, affects axonal transport and prevents some of the effects of chronic stress that I showed you in that one uh, experiment in rats. So what I tried to do is uh, uh, to tell you how if combining population neuroscience with experimental neuroscience is generating new knowledge that, of course, we are very interested in taking into innovative prevention and treatment strategies and starting by applying them at, in at-risk individuals. And, of course, using the tools that we have developed and, and got comfortable with, uh, with deep phenotyping in our large-scale studies, using those tools to assess of course, the outcomes uh, of those interventions and get some insights into how those interventions lead to either good uh, beneficial outcomes or fail. And I'll stop here and thank you, my collaborators, and you for your attention. Thank you. I'd just like to take this opportunity again to thank Professor Paus for what's been a really uh, in exciting and interesting talk about um, population neuroscience. And now I I've been asked in my best Italian manner uh, to ask Anna Angeli to come to the stage. So, Anna, andiamo, up here. <laughs> you, are, you are to receive a surprise. <laughs> We'd like to thank Anna very much for her uh, tireless efforts in putting together this conference. Um, it's been uh, a, a real triumph, I think I, uh, you'll all agree. I don't have the prize, so I don't know what it is. <laughs> Exciting. The whole team of Programma 2000 thanks you heartfully for your presence, your commitment, and inspiration. Thank you. Thank you.